I'm learning history in Cleveland, Tennessee. Old Coe Society, Five Points Museum. Telling a story of our history. Coming together as community. I'm Welcome to the Curious Curators Podcast with your hosts, Hope Vallum, Lindsay Shirky, and Elijah Hammonds, where we talk all things history and specifically tell the story of the Ocoee region here in Tennessee. Be sure to join us for our upcoming events. We have History Happy Hour, March 26, remembering the tornadoes of 2011. Also, we have an exhibit featuring four local artists called Voices of Art, opening the evening of March the 12th. This summer, our education department will be developing summer camps for kids in the Ocoee region. Today we'll be discussing the 1920s. Get ready for a wild ride. All right, today on The Curious Curators, we're going to talk about the 1920s. So we kind of picked that because, well, we're in the 20s again. And I think that it's something that a lot of people can relate to being interested in. Right, guys? Absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, I have a couple favorite things about the 1920s, but when I was doing... We know. (laughs) Well, what you don't know is that when I was doing some research for this podcast, I realized that a lot of those that were actually from the 1930s, so now I feel a little bit ridiculous, but that's all right, I guess. That's my life in a nutshell. (laughs) So I think the important part to understand... To begin the understanding of the 1920s is to start with the decade before. Mm -hmm. Um, They were coming out of World War I. Uh, They were coming out of a number of different social movements and uh, changing ideologies that were happening. One of the things that actually became very important, and especially later on, even into the 40s, was the Bolshevik Revolution, which happened in 1917, um, which was a part of the larger Russian Revolution spanning from 1917 to 1923. It was something that put the fear of communism into the Western world. Mm, Um, In Europe, it led to the rise of fascism. Um, In in the U.S., uh, President Warren G. Harding this was before he was president, but his presidential right. campaign slogan was a return to normalcy after World War I and comparing to all of these political social movements that were happening in Europe and in Russia with uh, the spread of communism, with the revolutions, with fascism. I mean, even in the 1920s, we were starting to see uh, the nascence of Nazism and the rise of Hitler. Um, and that's that's where a lot of these movements that we see culminate in World War II were starting to rise was in these at the end of World War One and into the 1920s. Yeah, one of the things earlier that I was talking to Hope about was um, the idea of propaganda sort of switching after the First World War into this public relations idea. And so Edward Bernays, who was the nephew of Sigmund Freud actually was one of these huge names in early advertising or public relations. And he switched after the First World War. He was the one of the council, like the public relations committee council members for the, like, the presidency to sort of promote the war, I guess, aims in mm-hmm. World War I and trying to just make it a more positive light and all of these things. And he switched when he got back. He realized that propaganda became a negative term, and so he switched his title to public relations council, which is actually super interesting. But it sort of goes into the ways that people started to advertise to different people in the 1920s. It's pretty interesting. I guess marketing's always been important. If you just want to market the American ideal... That's what they were doing, right? Marketing the American ideal yes. to everyone. That's what you had told Absolutely. me earlier. Yeah. Well, and and marketing became such a huge aspect of the 1920s with For the sure. rise of capitalism mm-hmm. um, and that importance. I know marketing, of course, existed before then, but really kind of hit the modern era type marketing we know today in the 1920s. Um, so I just want to begin by talking about 1920 itself and the most important things that started out with the 1920s. So the first thing that happened was the 18th Amendment. 
Prohibition. Prohibition went into effect in January of 1920. It would not be repealed until 1933. What um, a decade. What a decade and three years. And following very shortly after that was the 19th Amendment, women's suffrage, women had the right to vote. So actually there's a really interesting story about uh, women's suffrage and how the women's right came, women's right to vote came to be, and it happened right here in Tennessee. So... You need 36 states to ratify a constitutional amendment. We were at 35 states. Tennessee was the next to vote. They were going to vote no by one vote. Harry T. Burns of McMinn County. Mm. Which is right down the road from us. Yes, literally absolutely. Right down the road. Received a letter from his mother saying, please vote to ratify wow. this <laughs> amendment, essentially. Um, and he, he was very uh, close to his mother. She was a self-made woman. Uh, she ran her whole family by herself, uh, ran her uh, whole estate by herself. So he switched his vote and changed the entire 20th century by giving women the right to vote. Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify. He was He got a lot of flack for it, and his response was, a boy should always listen to his mother. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't disagree That's with amazing. him, and I think we should all be thanking Mr. Burns for that, because, yeah. hey. Because now I can vote. Exactly. <laughs> because now we can vote, and that is important. Always vote, kids. Absolutely, and March is Women's History Month. Just going to plug that right now. It is, it is, and we will be celebrating that in May here. So... I agree that it is extremely important to talk about the amendments that kind of came early in the 20s. But what about the things that those amendments caused? Like... Speakeasies. Bootleggers. Moonshining. I bet that you guys might recognize some of the names of people who ended up being bootleggers and then got a little bit famous afterwards. People like... Machine Gun Kelly. The, not the gangster, not the rapper. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. But also, Lucky Luciano was a bootlegger. Um, John Dillinger wasn't really a bootlegger, but he was robbing some grocery stores in the 20s. So that's another name that you guys might know. <laughs> yeah, he really did all of his bad stuff in the 30s. Also, though, Al Capone. Al Capone and the Chicago outfit, absolutely. You had a really big rise in gangsters and gang-related activities, especially related to alcohol. Um, you had speakeasies, gin joints. You had all kinds of names for those. You had uh, rum runners, bootleggers. Isn't that how the Kennedys got all their money? <laughs> Sorry, too soon. Just kidding, sort of. <laughs> but, yeah, so I think that's, like, a thing that, I think that's a thing that interests people, too, right? Just, like, that whole 20s vibe, I think. Because oh. I think everyone kind of thinks of, like, real glittery, fringy flappers and, you know, gangsters with, like, fat ties and a cigar hanging out of their mouth. It's I think that's a good... swing dancing and people... Lots of jazz. Heists and things like that. Tommy that guns. Just, yeah. I actually... Sorry, guys. I started <laughs> playing a dating simulator, which takes place in a speakeasy... Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It's not. It's not too. It's not too historically inaccurate. They do throw a lot of slang in there. That is pretty accurate. Um, however, it really glosses over the really terrible parts of the 20s. Well, I mean, yeah, because the 20s had no terrible parts, right? They were the uh, the ideal of like human life. Great Gatsby ideal, having Gatsby parties. You know, pools of champagne. I mean, that's my dream. That's all it is. That, that was the whole 20s. That was it. Bars yeah, absolutely. and pools of champagne. That was it. Absolutely. But was it really? <laughs> <laughs> Can that be the 2020s? Or Yeah, absolutely. That would right. be great for the 2020s. There actually is like a little bit of uh, congruency between the 2020s and the 1920s. Like they had fads too. Right. Um, did you, like crossword puzzles were apparently a fad back then. Now it's just kind of standard. But they did meme type things like pole sitting okay do you guys remember planking oh, a while gosh. back yeah. yes it was god awful wasn't it planking was huge was so kids have always I been doing fads i sound like i'm old i'm really not that old <laughs> like silly bands those were silly a, bands definitely a fad 
thank goodness we're we're done with that. That's good. Oh gosh, wait. Are those the ones that used to break? No. Those no. Those are like the it's oh. like shaped like <laughs> like little bracelets, and they're just rubber bands shaped oh, like tiny I meant stars so, or something. Oh, yeah, I meant something like else. That. Never mind. Yeah. So. Um, something else that was a fad was marathon dancing, which we kind of have flash mobs these days, so they would dance until you drop kind of oh, wow. thing. So they, they had a lot of their own things. I mean, yeah, but youngsters things- haven't changed <laughs> in a century. Guys, we're all under 30, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but some of, the, some of the uglier aspects of the 1920s that people tend to gloss over um, – you know, we had all these great technological advancements. We had the adoption, uh, the widespread adoption and proliferation of cars, telephones, films, radio, household electricity. By the end of the 1920s, almost every house in America had electricity. And this is one of the things that allowed for women to get more freedom and led to these flappers. And one of the great things about speakeasies was that they were uh, a place of racial mixing. Right. People of all races could go into speakeasies. True. Not a big mm-hmm. deal, but if you're talking especially in the South, you had Jim Crow laws, you had segregation, yeah. um, you know, people, you couldn't have interracial marriages, you couldn't be on the same train car in Tennessee. Uh, mental hospitals were segregated, you had uh, train cars segregated, private property, somebody could choose to segregate on their mm-hmm. own private property or their own private business, like a hotel could say, I don't want any blacks in my hotel, or mm-hmm. a restaurant owner could say no blacks. So private property was kind of... Uh, had its own sanctity, and they were allowed to do whatever they want with their own private property. Yeah, I read one of the worst, like, race riots, what happened in the early 20s in, mm, I don't want to lie, maybe Oklahoma City. Um, One of the worst recorded. That sounds right. That sounds right. I can, like, (laughs) just glance at it right quick. But I think that that's something that is glossed over a lot because people don't want to talk about that. Yeah. Because... The 20s is, a little, I would say, a little bit idealized. Yes. So people don't want to talk about idealized. that because well, it takes away from the perfection, right? Yeah, and people only think about urban life in the 20s, mm-hmm. not about rural life in the 20s, which no. very much stayed the same. They were very traditionalist, um, and that's, that's where prohibition really came from as well. So in rural areas, especially the South with the Southern Democrats, um, with the uh, evangelicals and the Protestants, they were for prohibition. Tennessee had the very first prohibition law, 1838. Mm-hmm. Tennessee had the very first prohibition law in the U.S. Well, Tennessee still has yeah, still dry counties. Yes, absolutely. Which, um, coming from Louisiana, I didn't even know that was a real thing. <laughs> I thought that was a joke or something when um, I found that out. I come from one county over, and I didn't know that until... <laughs> yeah. Until I started working in Cleveland. Which, um, Cleveland is not dry. There's there's a liquor store now. Well, yeah, now. They voted, remember? Yes, absolutely. That's why voting is important. Again, voting. Yeah, it's important. You right can get liquor stores. But in 1907, the sale of alcohol was prohibited throughout Tennessee. Ooh. Like, almost all of Tennessee was not allowed by 1907. This was way before the National Amendment, the Federal Amendment. Mm-hmm. And out of all the newspapers in Tennessee, there was only one one single newspaper that spoke out against the 18th Amendment. Do you know which newspaper that was? The Cleveland Daily Banner? The Chattanooga Times. Oh, so oh. close. <laughs> <laughs> the Chattanooga Times was the only newspaper that spoke out against the 18th Amendment. And this was before, like, Nashville and Memphis were, like, music hubs and stuff like yeah. that, wasn't it? Oh, okay, so... So yeah. they, so they would eventually big. change their tune as well. Yeah, I'm sure. After, after a little while. This podcast is a production of the Alderman Group. Be sure to check out all our upcoming events on our website at museumcenter.org. That's museumcenter.org. Let's continue with the show. So let's talk about something else that's unpleasant about the South. Um, okay. Or, <laughs> and, or the 20 South. You know, it's what ifs. <laughs> well, <clears throat> 1915, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, Birth of a Nation came out. Ooh. Oh, boy. Caused a resurgence in the KKK. The Ku Klux Klan had kind of disappeared. Sure. Yeah. It, it had almost all but disappeared. Mm-hmm. Uh, huge resurgence in the 1920s. I think by the end it had 4 million members of the mm-hmm. Ku Klux Klan. Goodness. Um, the 1920s also saw about 200,000 lynchings across the U.S., um, 
So if you're not familiar with The Birth of a Nation, it is a film um, that has been lauded for its cinematography, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's filmography, if that's that's a word. Um, We know what you mean. Cinematography was actually very revolutionary. However, the story that it told of uh, men in blackface Mm -hmm. attempting to sexually assault white women was kind of the storyline, with the KKK being the superheroes who came to the rescue of the white women. Right. Right. So this was in 1915, um, and ironically, he made a film the next year called Intolerance, Um. which was not about racial intolerance. It was about people being intolerant of his film, Birth of a Nation. Oh, my god! I mean, I wish that I had, like, that much you know, self-confidence that I did something really awful. And then I got mad at people for not liking it and did something else to, like, you know, really Absolutely. push it. I just wish that, like, really I was... this platform. Yeah, really. for good. You know, yeah. for good, definitely. Oof. But in 1920, we actually had the... We have the oldest surviving African-American filmmaker, film produced by an African-American filmmaker, called Within Our Gates, which a lot of people saw as a response to Birth of a Nation. It follows a mixed-race school teacher. um who is trying to get an education, she goes up north, and at one point, um, she is almost sexually assaulted by her by her biological white father. Oh, gosh. Wow. She didn't know it was him. He didn't know it was her until he saw a birthmark when he tried to tear off her blouse. Oh, my gosh. I bet that's so hard to watch. It, it absolutely is. Um, and also, something that he touches on as well is, the, is lynchings. Um, mm-hmm. Her adoptive black father, the protagonist, her adoptive black father is lynched for the murder of a white landlord, but he didn't do it. He was completely oh. innocent. So this was something that really touched on a lot of the darker aspects of mm-hmm. living in the 1920s right. and living during that time and the yeah. issues that arose in the South. That sounds so hard to watch. I've never seen that film, but it sounds very hard to watch. Hmm. But I'm sure we can find a copy of it somewhere. Yeah, it's called Within Our Gates by Oscar Michaud. Um, But but that's something we do see coming out of the 1920s as well as a lot of black excellence with the Harlem Renaissance. Um, You have writers like Conte Cullen, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, Mm -hmm. Elaine Locke. You have entertainers like Josephine Baker. If you don't know who that is, she wears the banana skirt and has the (laughs) cheetah. Like, you can picture her perfectly in your mind. Um, You have entertainers like Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong and Bessie Smith, who actually is from Chattanooga. Uh, We do have the Bessie Smith uh, Cultural Center down in Chattanooga as well. Yes. A um, lot of great jazz. Jazz actually came out of New Orleans from African Americans. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and there's, you know, if you've ever been there, still a huge jazz scene. So Oh, absolutely. Huge live music scene. It's great. Um, which is something enduring. I think something good that's enduring from that time is, like, the music was great. And I think even now, we listen to it, the postmodern jukebox music for our yeah. speakeasy oh, and stuff. Like, it was... Electro swing. Oh, yeah. still listen to that. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of good... Ca- well, I wouldn't say a lot of good. A lot of, like... A lot of enduring... Yes. Art. Came. Yes. And a lot of bad things... Ha- I think... I think that's the same with any idealized um, point in history, which we have a tendency to idealize a lot of history. A lot of different times, basically, Absolutely. that aren't the one that we were born in, seem just, you know, to be great. And I think that we definitely have a tendency to do that, to say, like, oh, that was, like, so great. I I wish I was alive then. Yes. And it's easy to do that with social media, especially today, to look back and be like, oh, well, if this is what they were living like, man, like the great Gatsby, like Leonardo DiCaprio, like living like that, like, whoa. Drop the bad and keep the good. That's what we do Yeah, drop the bad. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Um, We... Do, we do that so often, so I think that it's important to touch on the bad because yeah. it goes right over a lot of people's heads, which I think you started to do that in the exhibit too, which is great because it wasn't here really before. Very small bit. Yeah. So I think some of the things that you've added have really... Yes, I mean, there are there were some other really important moments within the 1920s that were really ugly. You had the Immigration Act of 1924, which restricted mm-hmm. a lot of immigration from people who were not Anglo-Saxons. Latin America, um, Asians, Southern and Eastern Europeans, um, just... They, they they started really restricting these, and a lot of mm-hmm. this act also built on a lot of previous immigration acts, um, ones that had completely banned like Chinese people from coming in, and all kinds of 
hmm. issues. Yes, yeah, so especially, um, I guess, after the war, it's a time to kind of build on existing stereotypes and everything else that were already there, which I think people have a tendency to do after, like, a great turmoil. So this is um, post-World War One and post-Spanish flu epidemic, where a lot of people were dying, and that yeah. also might have even been... Um, it traveled so quickly that if you were traveling, so if you came from overseas, you could have been sick, and mm-hmm. you could have gotten everyone else. You know, you could have gotten other people sick, which I mean, that still happens today, right? Yeah. Just think of all the times Elijah's been sick this year. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that really happened, uh, 1925, was the Scopes trial. Mm. Um, you know, a teacher uh, got in trouble for apparently teaching evolution over creationism in class. Oh yeah. Um, not too far from here. Right? Yeah, this, Dayton, this Tennessee. Dayton, Tennessee. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was apparently quite a public spectacle as well. I I was listening to some people talk about the experience of actually being there, and they said it was like a giant parade outside. People had signs. They had mm. all kinds. Of, people would dress up chimpanzees in people clothes <laughs> oh and goodness. parade them around outside. That is um, so crazy. And it, it kind of became a place of national attention, like the de, the defense, the lawyer was from Chicago. It was something that was uh, watched all over the U.S., and he actually, if you don't know, he did get convicted, basically on a technicality, mm-hmm. essentially. Um, but he he was essentially breaking Tennessee law, but it was a, it was a technicality. Hmm. I feel like Chicago plays a part in a lot of this. <laughs> like, we've Absolutely. mentioned Chicago quite a few times, which, I mean, doesn't really... Surprise me, Chicago's a big city, so there was a lot going on anyway. But well, they were they were kind of a hub in the 20s. Mm-hmm. Right, because, I mean, you know, they rounded out the 20s with the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So, oh, wow. Yeah, that, so that was um, February 14th. Um, so almost, you know, an anniversary here since it's February, I don't even know, February 10th. So we're getting close, by the way. Yeah. But... The anniversary of that, yeah. Yeah, I was actually at um, I was actually at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas a couple months ago, and they have like the wall there. That's I mean they've clearly like reconstructed. I don't think they just like hauled yeah. around an entire wall, but they've got the <laughs> bricks, and um, I thought that was really interesting. But of course they've got like red like paint on it. I guess to, I don't know if that was like just because that's what happened or just artistic whatever. But th- yeah, so like that's another thing that kind of. Bad things started to happen in 1929, because that's when the stock market crashed. Yep, mm-hmm. October 1929, Black Tuesday. So that was the end of that kind of era of prosperity that everyone's thinking, that economic post-war boom that happened. It did end in the 20s as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It ended at the... And then, of course, you have the Great Depression right, which, right after that. But people, people lost millions of dollars. I mean, an individual could lose more than a million dollars on that Tuesday. Um, it had been so, the stock market had been so unregulated at right. that time. Um, and, you know, everybody, this was part of that urbanization process, too. People were coming into the cities and especially towards Wall Street because they heard, oh, well, my cousin Jimmy, he hit it big on Wall Street, and right. I'm out here on a farm. Yeah. You know, and that was part of that urbanization process is people were going for economic proster- prosperity. And one of the, you know get-rich-quick schemes was the stock market, and people were gobbling up these stocks completely unregulated. I mean, we had that happen again in the modern era. Right. Um, Not as catastrophic for as large of a number of people, I don't think. Right, but, right. But, it, but that still does happen. I think people still think of the stock market as a get-rich-quick scheme. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, we were burned once, twice shy. Right. And I mean, of so, course, I'm, I'm terrified of that. I'm like, yeah. oh, no, I would never... Um, but and I do think that for some people it it's probably still like a quite lucrative oh, absolutely. game to play. But um, I mean, hell, I can't get rid of the stocks app on my phone; <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> but I think that that's that's kind of a low note, isn't it, to end that decade on? Is that yeah? After you really have a decade of uh, social change, uh, all of these wonderful artists coming out. You, you know, you had uh, Picasso and Magritte and Mondrian. You had Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, you had new uh, 
art movements. You had Dadaism, Surrealism. You also had Art Deco yeah. architecture. There's a new technology with film coming out. Yes. So you have the talkies. Talkies, yes. And yes. all right. these things. The jazz singer becomes a yeah. huge sensation. But well, and even, like, historical developments, right? They found King Tut's tomb in 1922. They did. Yeah. Was, did they not find, um, like, what they think is Troy around that time as well? Um, Islamic art kind of started coming into the mainstream, which is why you get the circles and the triangles and all that. And I think a lot of the gold comes from like King Tut's um, like tomb and everything, because I think everyone thinks like black and gold in the twenties, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be my. So this was a huge scheme. decade of you know change and mm-hmm. like of learning, expanding, growing, and then it all ends. Yeah, and like with a real bang, it really does, and not in a good way. Yeah. So I think that that's, it's kind of sad, isn't it? They don't really make that many movies focusing on, like, the super <laughs> high and then the super low. Um, because at, I think we at see At least that not high. really yeah. showing how it, how it was, no. Yeah, because, I mean, I couldn't imagine you're, like, living large and then all of a sudden everything that you have is gone. All yeah. of your money is gone. What do you do? Yeah. And our, our the media that we have tends to focus on... Um, they focus on the high life. They focus on the urban life. Mm-hmm. Um, they also focus on, if if they ever mention that start of the Great Depression, it tends to be a culmination end in that, and that's the end. Instead of seeing how people picked themselves back up and how they life goes on, yeah. you had to move on. Um, you know, there were people who did commit suicide, but every you know, that. more people didn't right yeah. then did like and they just moving. yeah they well, had to keep moving forward and that's what i said i said this at the beginning i thought a lot of those things that i thought happened in the 20s happened in the 30s like with a lot of like the gangsters and things like that bank robberies that were a complete and total like you know continuation of what happened then yeah like if you don't have any money what do you do yeah like, start a life of crime <laughs> and we see how well it worked out for all of them. And hey, prohibition was still going on up until 1933. Right, so. So, and that's that's a job in and of itself, right? That I mean, liquor is one of those businesses that is not affected by the economy. Mm-hmm. It's right. The economy gets worse, you start drinking more. I mean, there's a, I think there's probably just a few businesses that are like that. We won't mention any more of them here. But I do <laughs> think that um, liquor is definitely one of those, like... Vices. That's... Yes, a vice, lot of economy. Vice. <laughs> vice economy is not altered by economic downturn or upturn. It is always consistent. It is always there. I 100% agree with you. I think that that stands true to this day. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, I guess that's all we have for you today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for listening, and make sure you share with your friends. We're a new podcast. We want to get it off the ground. Make sure you like and share all these things. We'll be back next week with another riveting topic for you. Sweet. Bye. 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 Experience all the great things the Museum Center at Five Points has to offer by becoming a member with us today. Be sure to join us next time as we talk all things history and tell the story of the Ekoe region. I'm learning history in Cleveland, Tennessee. Ekoe's a society, Five Points Museum. Telling the story of our history. Coming together as community. I'm learning history in Cleveland, Tennessee. Oh, Chloe Society, Five Points Museum, telling the story of our history, coming together as community.